The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Are there any um, questions anybody would like to ask? Oh, go on straight away. Yes. I wonder when I sometimes sit to meditate as to is it better to use a particular technique sometimes whether it be focusing on breath or doing body scan or sometimes just simply sit and be. Sometimes I feel like just sitting and being but I feel like hmm, if I want to work towards you know, my spiritual progress is it better <laughs> to use a technique or just be? It's, um Sometimes techniques are just natural. So you don't have to use a technique. But nevertheless, that if you have a technique which you trained in before, then fine. But you said at the beginning of a meditation, as you get deeper and deeper and deeper, you'll find that all these techniques of body scan or uh, just messing around with your breathing, they are all unnecessary because the stillness comes when you're not doing anything, when you're just being peaceful. It is true that sometimes that when you are still, many people, they don't know what to do, so they tend to fall asleep. Now that's, you know, that's a common problem, but just hang in there, because soon the sleepiness vanishes. It's as if that we have a more subtle object, stillness, peace, silence, nothing really to excite us. And so it takes a much more subtle uh, attention to be able to stay with a peaceful mind. But after a while, you get used to this beautiful stillness and it gets more and more delightful in this last meditation I was really focusing and emphasizing the delight in meditation, <coughs> to appreciate it. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned in a, a talk yesterday, that when I first became a monk, I used to stay up one night a week meditating. We got to about 11 o'clock, I got very, very sleepy. And I wondered why? because about a year before I was still a lay person, I used to go to these all-night all parties or rock concerts. At 11 o'clock I wasn't tired or sleepy. And it wasn't the noise of like a rock concert, it was the fact that I was just enjoying what I was doing at 11 p.m. Therefore I wasn't tired. And the fact that what was missing in meditation, which was making me sleepy, which stopped me engaging was the, deli the delight, the interest, the happiness. And sometimes I appreciate just, isn't it wonderful when I was meditating just then, my body could vanish and I didn't need to cough. <laughs> now I'm back into my body, got to cough again. Just my body doing this, whatever it's supposed to do. So sometimes it's wonderful being free. Just in meditation, and I really appreciate that. And I delight in it. That's my delight, my happiness as a monk. And what happiness does a monk have? You know, we, we don't, we can't watch movies. Harry Potter, I don't know what that means. Or even recently, Game of Thrones. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, no, no, what's the recent one? Someone was telling me about um, Endgame. Avengers, Endgame. They asked me a question in, Sing in Indonesia about Thanos. <laughs> and what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> See, everyone else in the world knew about that, but not me. But anyway, that they had to explain it to me exactly just you know, how uh, Endgame, like super men and women and stuff, and about <laughs> Thanos apparently had is it three, six stones or three stones or something? And you brought them all together and then you could have a wish, whatever you wish. 
And they said, Ajahn Brahm, if you were Thanos had got the six stones all together, what would you wish? What would be your wish? And, uh, to destroy half of humanity, he said, no. To destroy greed, hatred, and delusion. That's what I would destroy. Huh, that's an interesting answer, they said. Well, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> what do you expect? I'm not into world conquering or domination. <laughs> anyway, just so... Uh, um, sometimes just enjoying being still and being peaceful. Just happiness. Yes. Oh, yeah. And um, I kind of surprised myself because I had an imitator, and then, of course, because I surprised myself, I lost it straight away. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, after a few yeah. minutes, I mean, I tried to hold it, but then yeah. it, it went. So can you talk a little bit about... Well, I mean, I know what I did. I can't yeah. Now, what happens It's pretty is, obvious. Yeah, but thank you for bringing it up because it happens to many people because we have all sorts of expectations. Mm. And just even like to expect something to happen. Now, expect is looking outside of this moment, looking somewhere else. So we don't expect. The opposite of expect is inspect. The opposite of excite is insight. In other words, going inside. And that's the, the idea of many times these deep meditations happening when you least expect mm. them. And of course, the obvious example of that was uh, Ananda. And Ananda's enlightenment who was you know, the, the attendant of the Buddha, sitting next to the Buddha for 25 years, listening to all the greatest of teachings, and seeing monk, nun, person after person, coming up to the Buddha, and we said, yes, well done, enlightenment, full enlightenment, another arahat in this world. And getting so impressed, except for Ananda, just was getting nowhere. And even when the Buddha passed away, Ananda still was an Anarahat. I thought, what hope is there for me? Sitting with the greatest teacher, I couldn't make it. Now he's gone, what shall I do? But they had this big meeting together, the first council. And they decided to have 500 members in this first convention. And obviously they get all the Arahats, the enlightened ones. But what about Ananda? He wasn't enlightened, but... You know, he was so knowledgeable about what the Buddha taught. So because of that, he, um, he got an invite. And he thought, how embarrassing. Tomorrow I'll face all my friends, 499 of them fully enlightened, and I'm the only one, the only one who isn't. That's pretty embarrassing. Mm. So he decided to meditate all night. Give it everything he'd got use every skillful means and every technique. And when the dawn came, he was still getting nowhere. Still not enlightened. So he decided to take a nap before the meeting. He let go. He gave up. He stopped trying. And before his head hit the pillow, he became another enlightened being, an arahant. He wasn't expecting it to happen that way, but that's how it happened. Mm. And so, so some of, sometimes we don't know what we're doing, we're just relaxing, letting go, and things start to happen. The water becomes still, and once the water is still, we look, hey, it's still, hey, look at this. Remember what it's still. Oh. <laughs> 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 and we mess it up. So if it's still, just leave it. So, when, so this morning then I had the problem, no, nah, don't want that, you know, put it down. So I just went into, I, I did the peace omata thing yeah. and then I actually just became peaceful. Exactly. And that was really lovely. And yeah. then I, I found like a lot of joy. Exactly, because peace gives rise to joy. Mm. The reason why it's joyful is that, again, it's again a natural state, the energy of our mind. We waste our energy. I waste our energy in thinking and doing stuff. 
And it's imagine all that energy has got nowhere else to go except into your mind, not thinking, not changing, not doing anything. And the energy of the mind builds and it becomes delightful. I said that story yesterday, you know, the gross story about going to the toilet and seeing the most beautiful piece of SHIT I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> And, you know, it's a gross story. This is absolutely true. It's in, I've written about this in, I think, uh, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond book. And why? You know, is you know, a piece of feces inherently beautiful? Of course not. It's just you know, what the mind puts into it. The mindfulness was so strong, so much joy. Everything was happy and beautiful. And this is actually why the breath becomes delightful. It's beautiful. Why? Because the mind is powerful and strong. And so you're having lots of joy because the mind was getting some power, some, some joy coming up. And that's the wonderful thing about so the Dhamma. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing, everything becomes so much fun and so much joy, so much bliss. It's coming from the mind. For those of you who know the Anapanasati Sutta, the fifth, sixth, seventh stage of Anapanasati, you're breathing in, experiencing pity. Breathing in and out, experiencing joy. Breathing in and out, calming that citta sankara. It's created by the mind. The pity, the sukha, it's not inherent in the breath. It's how the mind adds on to things. It's energized. It becomes how the mind enjoys the breathing. The most beautiful piece of SHIT, that was actually a chitta sankara. It wasn't a body sankara, it was a chitta. The mind was so powerful, you could look at anything, it was just so gorgeous. And of course, you're watching the breath, you're watching whatever, because it's so beautiful you can't take your eyes away. You get effortless focus. Just like I was so easy to stay awake listening to always at the doors in Jefferson Airplane, play all night. And no, no tiredness at all, I was enjoying it. So this is actually why, when you have that joy, that's what overcomes the tiredness. You really get into it, this is great. I don't want to fall asleep. It engages us and it gives you energy and joy. A natural form of joy coming from stillness. And in these states of uh, peace and joy, uh, when, when we are in um, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, does that help us to develop our wisdom? Absolutely. It's develop wisdom. What wisdom? We may have wisdom to be able to understand how the stock market works. We may have to have the wisdom of how to get elected in the next government. But that sort of wisdom is not so important. It's the wisdom about the nature of the mind and the body and how this all works. That sort of spiritual wisdom, now that is really important. And of course, you know, the nature of the body. The body vanishes in meditation. Good riddance. My old body, it's getting old now really old, like yours as well, live. Yeah, it is old. <laughs> so yeah, you welcome old age. I think it's really cool being old. And you get, you get many privileges being old. You can get really sick and says so you can take, well, actually I can't yet. I can't take a rest. But anyway, the people say, oh, you can retire. <laughs> can I retire, please? <laughs> can I? No, no, no. No, but what it means is that, you know, that um, your wisdom is the nature of the body, so you work with your body, you don't work against it. You work with your mind, you don't work against your mind. And then you just realize all oh, these things are not yours anyway. Nothing to do with me. And you allow everything to vanish. A sign of being detached is you can put things down when you need to. So what I'm hearing, Bande, is uh, even the short, brief, periods of meditation, we should then contemplate on what you're saying, the body and everything yeah. else. 
that don't. Yeah. Yes, it's just contemplation just happens naturally. You don't actually stop to contemplate. Just, this is, um, it, even the word contemplate sounds to me like too much thinking. I almost like prefer the word explore. So this was a little simile which I, I used, of all places, in South Korea, Daejeon, in the 2015 World Computer Congress, where I gave the keynote address, which was really weird. <laughs> what is Ajahn Brahm doing? So he needs help to actually, to, you know, sometimes when emails don't work, and he needs help, you know, and I was giving the keynote address at a World Computer Conference, and I held up, it's actually one of the plastic bottles of water. What's this? I asked the audience. And they were actually very compliant. They sort of said, oh, you know, it's a, it's a cup. It's got blue markings on it. It's got water in it. What is it? Let me hear some more. And all that was just thinking. But after a while, they ran out of words. I said, no, that's contemplating. You're allowing the mind to be still and just to observe this. And instead of giving it names, let it teach you what its meaning is, and hold it for a long period of time, and really interesting insights come up. So you explore, you allow the mind to stay with something and explore it in ways you've never seen before. Innovation. And that's actually what contemplation, you make the mind to be still, they can hold an object and stay there for long enough. And especially the nature of your body. People think they understand their body. Remember just years ago when we used to go and see autopsies, just asking the, the, uh, the coroner, or the coroner, the, actually the guy, the chief pathologist or whatever, the guy who did the cutting up of the bodies. He said, oh, this is what you do all day. Now, how do you feel? You know, we are, we're pretty sort of um, direct. Now, you're a guy, how do you feel going and you know, having relations with your wife? It's an interesting question. He said, well, no, I compartmentalize. I just, you know, my body is one thing, but the, the corpses which I cut up on the table are something completely different. And there's a separation there. But then, so, you know, even like a pathologist, do they really understand sort of the, <coughs> the, the body? Even if you work with them all day. But as a monk, you only understand the body when it vanishes when it disappears. And that's that simile which I developed. And it's the only simile which I have. But I had to actually to change it when I was in, um, in Indonesia because the election results weren't out yet and apparently the nickname for, for Jokovi uh, was Tadpole. And this is the story of the Tadpole and the Frog. And so when I started mentioning tadpole, they said, quiet, quiet, use something else. <laughs> <coughs> but anyway, any Indonesians here today? Did you know that sort of, that's right, what was um, Jokovic's, uh, it was a bad nickname. He so said it was just somebody who raised tadpoles or something. Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. But anyway, that, so a tadpole born in a lake, how can a tadpole ever know what water is? No more than a fish can know what water is. Even though it lives in water, swims in water, spends all its days in water, can never know the nature of water. But the difference between a fish and a tadpole is one day the tadpole grows into a frog and doesn't really know what it's doing. It just jumps outside of the frog, like you experience some peace. Where, where did that come from? It just grows and jumps out. Now that frog, outside of the water, something which has always been there is now missing. Some which is always taken for granted is now gone. Water. And that's the only time a tadpole or a frog can realize the wetness of water. Same when a person leaves their body in deep meditation. I don't mean not floating through the air, but just the body vanishes, you go into the nature of the mind. You realize this body is suffering. It's a pain. 
Not even if it's old, but even if it's young. Being free from your body. The Buddha always would keep on saying those things, and you know, the body is a prison because it's made up of cells. You know, it's a pain, but now you're experiencing it. Freedom from your body. It's just so peaceful, so wonderful, so joyful. And you understand, if you make the connections there, why would you ever be afraid of death? Death is a, a release from so much bodily suffering. Why should ever people always be crying when somebody's died? You should be celebrating. Yay! My auntie is free of suffering. Wee! You know, that was actually, to be quite honest with you, when my mother passed away, she had Alzheimer's for many years. When my brother called and said she passed away, she died, I thought, great, well done, Mum. You're free of prison. The prison of having this, this terror, which, you know, she was well looked after, but being the prison of Alzheimer's. It was a liberation. So I was actually quite, um, not because I don't love my mum, but because I was pleased for her. She was out of that pain of a body. So Bhante, the, ex the word exploring that you use, that comes naturally, I'm hearing that, is that right? Yeah, it comes naturally exploring, yeah. So we don't have to contemplate then? You don't have to, no. If you have a look at that, that's in one of the suttas there by the Buddha. He said, a natural path, one who has especially deep meditation uh, from samadhi, from stillness. They don't have to, to do any contemplation. It happens naturally. Tamata. Sorry to go again, uh, but had one follow-up question. So are we saying that if our mind just simply becomes quiet and peaceful and still, then that's where potentially insights would come from rather than worrying about a technique of vipassana that's meant to bring you insight? Correct. So it happens quite naturally. In fact, that if you start contemplating when you haven't gone deep enough, you find you, you just, it's old stuff, what you've heard before. It's nothing which is penetrating and which has really overcome some very deep misunderstandings of the Dhamma. So you go so still to, you know, to the jhanas, because it's in the jhanas where when you come out afterwards, the five hindrances, I mean, these are things which stop wisdom happening. So you don't see what you want to see, what you expect. You're not in any denial, you see what's really there. And of course, there's so many great psychology experiments about people not being able to see what they feel is impossible. And of course, the, the major one there was that little experiment done in Imperial College in London. You know, my friend Bernard, Professor Bernard Carr told me this one. That, so one of his colleagues decided to uh, demonstrate levitation of a flower pot. And he got all of his uh, colleagues, these were really top professors in London, experimental scientists, to come and see a demonstration of levitation. And he came in with a flower pot, carried it in, a pot, it's possible to see it's just a flower pot, you know, no tricks, no wires, put it on the laboratory table, got all the cameras, infrared cameras, ultraviolet cameras, you know, just everything, so to take a really good recording of this if it happened. And then he asked all of the people in the audience, all his professors, can you please help by chanting Om? And all his professors, because they were friends of his, started chanting Om, Om, Om. <laughs> and because of that holy chant, or at least when they started doing that chant, the flower pot lifted up off the table. It worked. He levitated the flower pot. They had cameras there. And they recorded everything. <coughs> and even when some of those professors, when they, sh no, they were there, they saw it. They said they were supposed to have seen it, but they said, no, it never happened. It was on the table all the time. It never rose up in the air. It said, look, here's the photographs. Photoshopped. Doctored. Fake. It had risen above the air, but they 
the whole purpose of that experiment was not to demonstrate levitation, because what had actually happened, they'd installed a huge electromagnet under the bench. <laughs> and that's what actually levitated the flower pot. But they had to, you know, whenever you turn on a very strong current, powerful current, it always makes a humming noise. So in order to make sure that the trick was not exposed, they had to get everybody to chant om, 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 <laughs> just to disguise the current. <laughs> but that was not the purpose of the experiment. The even trained scientists, when they saw something, it never actually came to their conscious awareness. It was denied access to awareness, simply because it was just too impossible. So the idea of bare awareness, by the time it comes to your conscious awareness, it's already been filtered and bent. Except when the mind has been cleared of those hindrances which bend the truth to fit what you want to hear, what you want to see, what you want to feel. That's the purpose of deep meditation, to take away that, that distortion of our perceptual framework. And we see what's impossible. I know that people love psychic stuff. But you know, in my life as a mate, I've seen some really weird stuff. And people love weird stuff. There's this, Mark, do you remember the monk Sudama in uh, Indonesia, very powerful monk. He would teach meditation in Bangkok. <coughs> one of the, the uh, people I knew very well, she freaked out one day. She was in the meditation class. She realized something was going on. And this monk, this monk was looking at one of the meditators and laser lights were coming out of his eyes into this, this meditator. A really a juicy psychic power, not reading minds, because anyone could actually cheat on that one, but real laser lights coming into the mind. Do you believe that? If you saw that, maybe you wouldn't even see it, because you've been denied such a thing can't exist. This is one of the reasons why reality can be weird. We can deny it. We're not even aware that it's happening. We just can't see it. That's the nature of perception, the nature of knowing. So much of it is suppressed because it's just too challenging. Go on. Ajahn, <coughs> we have a few online questions. Do we have time still? Yeah, sure, I'm happy. Okay, so one, maybe a quick one. <coughs> if one meditates with eyes open, facing a blank wall, is it possible to enter nimitta or jhana with open eyes? Yeah. Um, no, it's not really. Uh, you have to close your eyes sooner or later. But that time when I... I always very like to explore different techniques, different ways of meditating. And I remember going to that Zen monastery in uh, North England years ago. And that's how we had to meditate. Open, open eyes facing a whitewashed wall. Because I'd meditated before, I knew how to be silent and peaceful and just not expect anything in the moment, not thinking. And then that blooming wall vanished. It disappeared. It just wasn't there anymore. That was freaky. Walls aren't supposed to vanish out of existence, but it did. And I thought, wow, this is amazing, this is great. I wasn't scared, I was like intrigued. And of course, it's just a natural phenomena. If you watch a wall and really put your attention on that wall and nothing moves or changes, the brain turns off the sense of sight. Because the brain will only be able to notice things which change. If it's always there, you don't notice it. Just like a computer, if you don't uh, tap the keyboard or move the mouse, <coughs> the screen goes blank. Sound, if the sound, the background sound doesn't change, 
then of course the sound turns off, doesn't hear it anymore. So this is actually where you get a lot of wisdom about the nature of the mind. It only notices things which change. Things which are always there, you can't see them. You can't perceive them. That's why the tapo can never know water. Except when water stops. When it anichers. That's what anichir means. Something always there has gone. Impermanence. Thank you, Ajahn. And the, there are two quick questions, uh, or two questions that are related. They are about suffering that comes up, or uh, aggravation, or pain that comes up during meditation, and what to do about that. Yeah, we'll just move. Just change the posture. Uh, I think it's less um, physical uh, suffering than mental suffering. Once, once I seem to suffer and get meditation wrinkles on my temple. Meditation wrinkles on your temple. My goodness, try Botox. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> now, it's nice actually to let go of your body as soon as possible. So in other words, you know, follow the instructions, you get nice and comfortable in your meditation, as best you possibly can. Relax the body. And then when you go into your mind, relax your mind, at that time, you know, you're part of the car, you're not sitting in the car anymore, you're sitting in this hall over here. Just leave the car outside, it's well protected. And then you can just enjoy the, the peacefulness of not having a body. For a little while. And then you can enjoy the, the breath or the mind, whatever you, you're watching. And then the, that's the body just relaxes by itself when you're not watching it. <coughs> When I was meditating, I wasn't coughing, I don't think I was anyway. But you know, now I'm sort of back into my body, you know, just irritation, you cough every now and again. So just the wrinkles all go when you meditate. I can't see their answer, but I'm sure they're happy with that. Okay. Very good, excellent. Okay, so um, now is, is it, it's a bit early for that. Yeah, excellent. So do you want another? Okay, excellent, great. I think there are more questions. Yeah, okay, yes, we can do that. And of course, you know, once we have our lunch, and you can actually tidy up if you can, please have your lunch as mindfully as possible, so don't use it as an opportunity to go and chat to one another. Try and keep a bit of silence in the place. And you know, when we finish this afternoon, then you can do all your chatting if you want to. But right now, you know, keep it nice, contemplative, peaceful, still at atmosphere and then it means that it enhances the meditation and this you know if you feel a bit tired you can have some tea or coffee or something if you need to find a nice quiet place you can meditate and then I'll be back here about one to actually do some more meditation and some more instructions um, could you explain what enlightenment is like and um, is it something that comes and goes or is it something that stays with you yeah, what well, enlightenment is an easy question. <laughs> At least it should be easy to answer. Because it's one of the reasons why, you know, being born in a, a Christian world, going to a school which has an Anglican chaplain, you know, I was really interested in spirituality. So I remember going up to the chaplain and asking him, look, now, I, I don't want to criticize anything, but you know, what is this God we're supposed to worship? You know, describe it to me. I just can't get my head around. What is God? And they said, well, God is the ineffable. It's beyond words, the ground of all being, the alpha and omega. That's you know, the A to Z. It's the ineffable, you know, beyond words. Yeah, but actually, what is it? That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to me. The ground of all being, I know what the ground is, and get some idea what being is, but ground of being, it was just like gobbledygook words. And so then later on, when I became a, a Buddhist, I remember going to, to ask you know, one of the, the top Sri Lankan monks in London, well, what is enlightenment? It's beyond words. It's ineffable. <laughs> the ground of all being. I think I've heard that somewhere <laughs> before. But then later on, you, know, you get to somebody who actually really meditates and just goes very deep in meditation. 
And they get some wonderful innovative answers. And of course the best answer, what is enlightenment, is that story of the five children with the wishing game. And not only does it show what enlightenment is, but it also makes it easy to understand where people go for other forms of happiness and meaning in their life, instead of enlightenment. And even though the story is easy to understand, please never think it's not profound. People sometimes make a, a, a mistake. They think if they can understand it, it's not deep. <laughs> in other words, the more that I can confuse you, oh, that's really deep teachings. <laughs> but people would understand when the Buddha taught, even people with very little education. So did the Buddha not give deep teachings? Of course he did. So this is the five children playing wishing game. The game has these rules, you have a wish, whoever gets the best wish can win the wishing game. First kid said, I wish for a, a new Nintendo, a new computer game. I don't know anything about computer games, but anyway, you get some idea. Good. Second kid said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for a computer game shop. Because with my own shop, my own store, I can get a new computer game when the next one comes out. It's obviously superior than just having one computer game. Third kid, if I had a wish, I'd wish for 100 billion dollars US. <laughs> and with such a large amount of money, I'd buy my own computer game store. But the trouble is, my parents never let me play computer games. They say I should do my homework first. So then I'll buy my own private school. <laughs> and because I pay the teachers, including the principal, I'll make sure they always give me top marks so I can spend no homework needed and I can always spend all my time playing computer games. When I graduate from my own school, I can buy my own university and I can all give myself honorary degrees. And that means I get all these qualifications and certificates and spend all my days doing computer games. And whenever there's something else which I need with $100 billion US, I know I could spend that amount of money. It won't, no human being anyway in that one life. So I'd always have something, some money to get whatever I want whenever I want it. It's obviously superior. There's two more children left in the computer game. Uh, so in the wishing game. Um, contest. The next girl, really wise, she said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for three wishes. That's a wish. <laughs> <laughs> and for my first wish, I'd have the computer game shop. For my second wish, I'd have the hundred billion dollars US. For my third wish, I'll have three more wishes. <laughs> <laughs> that way, I can go on forever. <laughs> Beat that. That's a pretty smart girl. And the next person said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed any wishes ever again. That's enlightenment. Not an infinity of wishes, which is power. Not just uh, an infinity of wealth, which is, you know, what I'd never under... <coughs> never understood why it is millionaires, billionaires, Mr. Trump's, even Mr. Turnbull's, why they want to join politics. And why they want to get into that for? They've got enough money, they can retire. Why do they want to do that for? It's like power. You have the ability to have wealth, get whatever you want, but that's not enough. Then you want all your wishes sort of fulfilled. But beyond that is being so content, you never needed any wishes ever again. The end of craving, the end of wanting, enlightenment. That's why in meditation, if you can let go of wanting just for a little bit, you know, just to see how the mind becomes so still and contented and so joyful. Why did I ever want anything before? When, when I let go of wanting, my mind becomes so joyful and so peaceful a taste of enlightenment. 
a taste of freedom. So this is actually what enlightenment is. We taste it when we get into deep meditation. I ask you now, just usually we're not supposed to think too much of the past, but in your life so far, what's been your happiest moment? The moment which stands out where you felt so content, so happy, so joyful. The sort of moment when you remember it and you think, could I change anything to make it better? No, you were with the person, the people which you know you want to be with. A time when everything seemed to be just so perfect, you didn't need to change anything. You were so content. There's the times when you didn't want anything. You didn't want to change anything. That moment was just satisfying as it was. It's a moment where all wanting, all desires, all negativity, for some reason, had subsided. You had a glimpse, a taste of freedom. So happy, so content, not wanting anything in the whole world. Shame it didn't last. If it lasts, it's enlightenment. Freedom. Okay, next question. I'm not sure how best to word this question. Um, for meditation, what's the ultimate goal of uh, meditation um, based on the Buddha path mm. versus meditations with yoga center and all the lifestyle meditation uh, courses out there? Okay, to put it bluntly, the main goal of Buddhist meditation is uh, abandoning all goals. Abandoning all goals, all destinations, all places you want to be in the future. Not self-improvement, but number one, just realizing you're good enough as you are. You just go according to nature. It's not your fault if you have a cough or if you fail. It's not a great, wonderful thing that you're healthy. It's just nature, that's all nothing to do with me. None of my business. So no goals, just being here. Having a goal, an aspiration, takes you away from being here. I don't know why that, you know, when I was young, people never had any of these bucket lists. Things they had to do before they died. <laughs> and it's crazy, it just gives you more business, more work, more travel, more stuff to worry about. So, wonderful, if your bucket list, what do you want to, where do you want to go, what do you want to do, what do you want to achieve before you pass away? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. And I do have friends from other religions. If they're cheeky, I'm very respectful of other religions and people of different faiths. It was an amazing time over in Indonesia, just even one of the organizers of, of I think, my retreat in Bandung, uh, she was a Muslim. She was the head of the committee organizing my retreat. Well, that was really cool. But, and there's many Christians there as well. But anyway, that, but if any person of a different religion gets cheeky with me, I give as good as I can. <laughs> So anyway, this, uh, this uh, Christian friend said, I was going overseas and had a conversation. He said, you know, Ajahn Brahm, you've got to admit, you've got to admit, come on, you know, I've known you for a long time, you're a truthful, honest person, that nothing is higher than God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I looked at him and said, yeah, you know, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And he looked at me surprised that I gave in so easily. You mean you sort of believe in God? And I said, nothing is higher than God. Nothing. Emptiness. <laughs> That's much higher than your God. <laughs> and he said, that's not what I meant, that's not what I meant. <laughs> so I was just having fun, and he knows that. I was just having fun with him. So we just enjoyed a good laugh together. Or just like the, the, the old Benedictine abbot, which I really sort of uh, had good friends with. Abbot Placid, his name was. We had a Benedictine monastery up in, in the north of West Australia. And... I remember just we had great fun together. We were just uh, walking through this monastery once, and I said, "This is a very old monastery. It's one of the oldest buildings in West Australia." And they said, "Are there any ghosts in this monastery?" And he said, "Oh, in the Catholic Church, we don't believe in ghosts." What about the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Got you, <ya>, caught you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have great fun together. <laughs> so humour is a wonderful part of our spiritual life. So never abandon your sense of humour. Lightheartedness. <coughs> That's it, is it? No, I can't. Yeah, there's more. Yes, whatever there, yeah. Hello, John Brown. Hi. Um, um, so. Every time I face a stressful situation, at the end of this, like after facing the situation, I get peaceful. So how do you keep your mind so you get peaceful in the stressful situation? In a stressful situation, you just um, don't have any goals of what you want to achieve in a stressful situation. It's the outcome is not important as the process is important. So, you know, to try and sort of get to some goal, this is what I want to achieve, it means that just the end will start to justify all sorts of terrible means. It's okay to tell a white lie because it's really, really, really important. No, it's not. So it means the stress of the moment, you can only do one thing at a time. So you be in this moment, be kind. The person in front of you is the most important person in the whole world. And if you make this moment, as beautiful, as kind and caring and as aware as you possibly can, then the stress disappears. Stress is just like the guitar string. You stretch it, there's pressure on it, something pulling you one way, something pulling you the other way. If you can lessen the, the, the tension, so the future is not pulling you to some sort of goal or some sort of outcome, and the past, you know, the, I really failed last time, I don't want this to happen again. You're not being stretched by the past or the future. You let those past and future go. You're in this moment, there's no stress. When you don't want anything, you're just being kind, being caring, being alert in this moment. And all the stress vanishes. We're not dragged down by the past by the trauma, the failures, what perceived failures of the past, and then when you let go of the past and future, there's no stress. There's nothing pulling you one way or pushing you the other way. There's no, don't worry what other people think of you. Because that also causes you stress. Trying to live up to other people's expectations. Your mother's, mother's expectations, your partner's expectations. Oh, there's so many expectations. And it just drives you crazy sometimes. Other people's expectations of me, it's not my business at all. So, leave that alone, that's you know, your problem. So, so when you face that problem, what you mean is just be there? Like just be, be there. That's it. Okay. Yeah, be there and just expect the unexpected. Because yeah. sometimes you think it's a problem, but it turns out it's not a problem at all. You actually made up the problem. You looked at something, and you're the one who added problem to whatever was happening. Being sick is not a problem. No. Dying is not a problem. For those of you who want to see, <coughs> uh, there was a, a story 
uh, from experience, it's in, I think, the first book, Open the Door of Your Heart, of pushing the wheelbarrows for nine days. I remember just, Ajahn Chah said we had to move all this earth, pushing the wheelbarrows for three days, it was just really hard work, really dirty and stinky. But of course, after three days, I could take a rest, meditate, wash my robes. But then he left the monastery uh, to visit somewhere else. And the second monk said, no, we put it in the wrong place, we've got to move it. Another three days I had to work. We had a good point, I can understand the logic of his reasoning. Three other days we had to put, move that earth. And after six days of work from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock in the evening, so you couldn't really see very much anymore. I'm really dirty, tired. I never became a monk to become a laborer. I was being exploited. But at least after six days, I had faith and my teachers knew what they were doing. And then after six days, I thought, now can I take a good rest and really wash myself? And then Achan Cha came back and he said, I thought I told you to put the earth over here. Now it's over there. Move it back again. <laughs> That's why I totally lost my faith. And then the wisdom of these teachers, I started swearing. And one of the monks saw that I was not happy, and they came up to me and they gave me this beautiful wisdom, which I will never ever forget. They said, thinking about it is the hard part. Pushing the wheelbarrow is easy. Oh wow, that was worth six years of pushing wheelbarrows. <laughs> so whatever you have to face, problem in life, difficulty, having a biopsy, having a mastectomy, just you know, having a death or whatever, thinking about it is the hard part. That's what causes the problem and suffering. So learn just how to just do it, see what happens. You don't know what's going to happen, just good, bad, who knows? You've got to shrug your shoulders when you say good, bad, who knows? Thank you very much, Ajahn, um, for, for doing this retreat. Um, so if somebody is sit, okay, we talked about stressful situations. If somebody's sort of sitting face to face, like the boss from hell, oh, yeah. and actually berating you, yeah. how do you actually deal with the situation like face to face? How, how do you cope with that? Easy. <laughs> Shrug my shoulder? Yeah, yeah, just listen. Right, okay. And he said, very good. Okay. <laughs> You don't believe a word of it. And then as soon as you go, there's some reason for that. Sometimes it's the boss is in a bad mood that day. Well, you know that story was the girl who was over in um, Sydney who went to <coughs> She was called over to London, all the way from Sydney, to actually to sign this contract, make, take her business up to the level, next level, fashion business. And I said, we're ready to sign a contract. So she had this little girl, Holly, very beautiful little three or four year old, and said, well, um, I have to go over to London to sign this contract. So the, uh, her husband looked after the kid, and she flew over there, a moment's notice, just had time to check into the hotel, have a shower, go to the boardroom. All the directors were there, but not the boss yet. And he said, who are you? He said, I just came over from Sydney, flew all this way, hadn't had any rest yet, because I was called, oh, you, yeah. You might as well fly back to Sydney. Now, the boss is in a filthy mood. Boss, in no way is he going to sign your contract, or any contract today. It's best to get out of here. <coughs> he said, no, I've come all this way, at least I'm going to see him. Suit yourself. So what she did... She went into a corner of the boardroom, sat on the floor, crossed her legs, and did some meditation. The loving kindness meditation. May all beings be happy and well. May all <coughs> bosses be free of suffering. <laughs> and she was good at it. So when the boss eventually came in, came into his boardroom, and you notice how um, control freaks, such bosses are. Saw this woman she never seen in her life. He's never seen in his life before. Who's that? What is she doing in my boardroom? Was that effective, by the way? Does that sound angry? Because <laughs> I often say I never get a chance. I never get a chance to get angry as a monk. Mm. So sometimes when I say stories like this, I really get into it. <laughs> 
And so, you know, she sort of, and he was glaring at her like some monster. And so, because she'd just been meditating, she just stood up and walked right. It's not scared, because you don't get scared when you've been meditating. Went right up to the boss, and she said these words just tumbled out of her mouth. Just not, not sort of, in, not intentionally, not sort of, uh, uh, just preformed. She looked into his eyes and said, you have such beautiful blue eyes, like my daughter Holly back in Sydney. That's not what a boss from hell expected. He was trying to intimidate her, and instead he got this sincere praise. And he didn't know how to cope with that. And she said his face was just total confusion, until it softened. And he smiled after about one or two minutes, said, really? I've got beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> and they signed the contract within the next minute. <laughs> and she was so happy, but she wanted to go home to take, go to the, to the um, hotel to take a rest. She was jet lagged and tired. But the directors would not let her go. They said they formed a circle around her, said, we are not letting you out of this boardroom until you teach us how the heck you did that. <laughs> <laughs> that is how to treat a boss from hell. But you cannot plan it, it has to really come from the heart. And you know, you can just totally, if you're a meditator, just like the Buddha, face down Nalagiri, the mad crazy elephant. And the crazy elephant was subdued with loving kindness. Okay, so I think it's probably time for lunch now.